No? Okay, let me start today again, continuing uh, from yesterday. And uh, uh, there's something I want to tell you, and I forgot. Uh, we'll worry about this later. So, we're talking about this yesterday, about this mechanism, the components going into it. This is just in case for, this is just for those students who are using reaction mechanism for your work. And uh, a, a good thing to do is to understand every component of this type of reaction model. A reaction model is a collection of reactions. Uh, you have the, uh, because this are all of them are elementary reaction, therefore they must be reversible. All you have to do is, is express the rate expression in the forward direction. The back directions are calculated from thermochemical data. As we discussed this yesterday, the back rates are equally important. Therefore, you have to make sure that the forward rate parameters are consistent with the definition, or rather the assignment for thermochemistry. In particular, what you want to do is, before you run anything, you want to make sure that there will be no rates exceeding physical, physically allowed limits. And we'll talk about this tomorrow. That's the collision theory and the transition state theory. Okay. And that component is important. If you don't do that, you will see artificial rates popping up all over the place. So we have the A factor, we have the temperature exponent, we have the pseudo uh, uh, activation energy. Don't worry about this column yet. Uh, in mechanisms or in models that I develop, I like to assign the uncertainties to each and every rate parameter. And we'll talk about this on Friday. And uh, you have a bimolecular reactions. They are expressed just like how we know how uh, they're expressed. Then in, for some of the unimolecular or bimolecular recombination reactions, you see additional items showing up. In this case, the recombination with two hydrogen atoms producing H2 expressed in the low pressure limit, and you'll see those additional lines popping in. Usually, it's a constant. For example, you have, uh, well, uh, what is this, argon expressed, and this is the helium. Yeah. Expresses a value of 0.63. These are Chevron efficiencies. And let me explain what they are. Okay. For Mountley, the name M stands for all gas molecules. But not every gas molecule would have the same efficiency in removing excess vibrational and rotational energy. In general, monoatomic notably noble gases like argon and helium, have smaller efficiency in removing this excess vibrational energy. Therefore, relative to nitrogen, where M here is a reference to nitrogen, so nitrogen would have this chaperone efficiency of a unity. The remaining are expressed <coughs> relative to nitrogen. Okay? In other words, if you have argon having chaperone efficiency equal to 0.63, it means that relative to nitrogen, this collider is about 40% less efficient. Or its efficiency for removing energy, or conversely, for exciting the H2 molecule from the back reaction would be only 60% compared to nitrogen. In addition to it, not every species would have a temperature independent uh, 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 chevron efficiency. Relative to nitrogen, for some of the species, for example, the carbon dioxide, there is a temperature exponent in the chaperone efficiency specification. Okay. Now watch out. The chemical code does <coughs> not account for, it cannot take into account those temperature exponents. Usually what you do is you express, expand this reaction and explicitly write 2H plus CO2 producing H2 plus CO2. You then assign the chaperone efficiency over here to be zero, and you lump this 0 0.309 into the A factor, and temperature exponent add on to that. You ex write them explicitly, okay? And this is something you need to worry about. Now, in other cases, what you find is, uh, do I have an example here? Yeah, I have an example. Uh, all right. 
if you look at the CO plus O, recombining, forming CO2, recall I said this about yesterday, that for those reactions that it would show a fall-off behavior, neither in the low pressure limit nor at a high pressure limit, you have to describe this fall-off behavior. And this fall-off behavior is expressed in several parameters. In this case, you have the high pressure limit rate constant. You then have the low pressure limit rate constant. And those chaparral efficiency are obviously applied only to low pressure limit rate constant. Okay. And detailed expression for accounting for pressure fall-off, I will talk about them tomorrow after I discuss the RKM theory. And this is all uh, 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 I think I wanted to talk about in this sort of uh, table. Again, I want to remind you that an issue remains to, to be resolved is how do you reference the source of rate constants. Okay? And I hope one of you or many of you will come up with a solution for the future. How do we do that? Okay. This afternoon you will hear, uh, tomorrow you will hear from Professor Jackie Chen talking about the cyber combustion. I think one of the items we need, issues we need to deal with in the future is obviously you don't want to do this hand by hand. You don't want to do the dumb thing I did for many years. Do this uh, along table by hand. <coughs> and uh, ideally what you want to do is deal this through information technology. Okay. Is there a way you can extract this information from the web with a small computer code organizing in such a way that when you produce a reaction mechanism, you automatically can go to the source. All right, this is arcade. Arcade in the sense that you are a lot more uh, 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 familiar with the web perhaps than I do. Would it be possible that you click on a reference and a comment and have the original contribution showing up? Moreover, sometimes those reference refer to rate constant uh, evaluation source, and they collect many rates, evaluate them, and therefore below that you may find uh, several tens to several hundreds of papers. Okay, and this is something that we need to worry about. Uh, for example, the H plus O2 reaction, the first one, if you check the uh, uh, Google it or do Web of Science search number of papers involved in measuring this rate constant you will find over 130, okay? You'll find 130 of them. Therefore, how do you manage this information in the long run becomes a major issue, all right? All right, that's all what I want to talk about. Let me move on. <coughs> now, I want to talk about moving on to the ladder of uh, uh, what I call the foundation field chemistry. The CO oxidation, all right? For many of you, uh, when you, if you took a combustion class, this is something you know. And for those of, who, of you who haven't had a combustion, I want to just briefly go over it, okay? Carbon monoxide, on the other hand, does not burn on its own. <coughs> Never does, okay? The fundamental reason for that is you don't have a chain carrier at all. It's not even a straight chain mechanism. Consider you have CO, and it reacts with molecular oxygen. Well, in the beginning, before anything starts, you only have CO and oxygen anyhow. Produce CO2 with an oxygen atom, but the next, in the next step, oxygen atom recombine with the CO to form CO2. So you have initiation, you have termination. The entire rate of CO oxidation is entirely governed by the first reaction. That's a rate limiting. But that's a molecule-molecule reaction. Having high activation energy is very slow. It won't go very fast. So CO on its own in the oxidizing mixture with oxygen shall never explode. Okay. Now, much of the early study, about 40, 50 years ago, there have been for years we were stuck with the problem of CO oxidation. Okay there were inconsistent experimental results. And it was recognized later that water, trace amount of water, is going to impact the oxidation process. Water as an impurity is going to impact the oxidation rate tremendously. Where does water come from? Well, if you use a Pyrex or if you use a quartz reactor, 
of your stainless steel. Water always gets onto the surface, and it's very difficult to get rid of it. And a trace amount of water is enough to catalyze the reaction. The mechanism is simple. If you have some water around, that's the, this mechanism. If you have some water around, the first the oxygen atom produced is going to react with water, okay? producing two hydroxyl radicals. The hydroxyl radical will oxidize carbon monoxide, producing CO2. Now you're producing the hydrogen atom. Do you see that? With another hydrogen atom, you now can do the chain tri branching, producing O and OH, which comes back to facilitate this cycle. It doesn't matter how much water you have, just a small amount is enough to speed up this process tremendously. And therefore, the irreproducibility in early experiment has to do with water absorption in the system. Okay. So the other thing that uh, related to this topic is I want to just make a small comment. If you have a closed chamber, if you do experiment, combustion experiment, and if this experiment is done in a closed chamber, and if the chamber is made of steel or stainless steel, be careful. Watch out. Stainless steel is a water sponge, and it's almost impossible to get rid of water absorbed on the surface. Therefore, when you eva evacuate the things, if you're in a continuous operation, that's not a problem. You reach some sort of a steady state. And especially when water is produced in large quantity continuously. But if you do batch experiment, static reactor, you're going to have to watch, worry about this issue. Okay? You vacuum the chamber down, and you fill in combustible mixture. You let things go. Well, the water absorbed on the surface is going to come out. How much of it depends on how you do the experiment. All right. How many of you have played with a glove box? You have. And you use a stainless steel glove box or it's a plastic uh, glove box? <laughs> Literally both, yeah? yeah? And you probably can tell how difficult it is to get rid of the moisture inside of a glove box. Yeah. Yeah? It takes weeks. Many trains of the, 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 the molecular sieve, multiple water solvent, you have to recirculate it, and then you have to flush it with dry argon. Okay, watch out. This is an issue that we, those of us who do combustion, don't pay much attention to. And watch out, your experiment might be well contaminated by. Yeah, yes, please. How about steel? I'm sorry? How about carbon, steel? carbon steel is even worse than stainless steel. Okay. Because of the surface area of uh, carbon steel on the surface is even higher than stainless steel. All right. Any other? <coughs> now, the point I want to make is this is just not, not just one, this example I want to especially emphasize. This is just an issue that occurred very recently and caught my attention. And in combustion, when you're doing an experiment, because of this radical chain branching, a small impurity could cause big changes, big changes in what you wish to observe. In, for example, shock tube measurement, I'll talk about shock tube uh, on Friday somewhat. <coughs> You're all familiar with shock tube measurement, measuring ignition delay, for example, right? Now, back in the 70s and 80s, when this shock tube research just got started, measuring ignition delay, it was a religious, it was a religious to make sure you use high purity chemicals. Why? We paid a price. We paid a price on acetylene. Acetylene, when you measure it, well, acetylene, you all know, has triple carbon-carbon bond. The bound energy of carbon and hydrogen acetylene is about 130 kilocalories per mole. By far, the strongest the carbon-hydrogen bond you find. So in theory, this molecule, while very energetic, should not be ignited very easily. But then, when you do shock tube measurement, you get an activation energy of the order of 28 kilocalorie per mole. That's teeny compared to average fuels. Typically, you'll find something of the order of 30 kilocalorie per mole for an alkene. So
So the fact that uh, citrulline has an apparent activation energy of ignition, 28 kilocalories per mole, is very troublesome to, be, to explain it theoretically. What well, turns out that when you make acetylene, you always have a little acetone in it. So that when you do your experiment, acetone always get into the <coughs> mixture. Acetone, having oxygen locked onto one of the carbon, would give you a very small bond CH energy, CH bond energy. The result is the initial, dissoci initial dissociation of acetone gives rise to free radicals, okay? Rather than acetylene itself, or the reaction of acetylene with molecular oxygen. It wasn't until we cleaned it up acetone completely from the reagent acetylene uh, that we started to get rep reproducible results. Chain branching can mess you up. We talked about this yesterday. It takes about 30 cycles for a chain branching cycle Okay, before you get an explosive behavior. If you can short circuit this whole process by 10, not 30, but a 10, with some other impurity, okay, things will get messed up. Alrighty? So you would think that a fast process is typically is not so sensitive to secondary effect. That's not the case here. All right. In flames, you won't have that a big problem because of the back diffusion of the radical from the flame to unburn the mixture. That kills the impurity effect. So if you run a measure the flame speed, you use 98% pure uh, reactant mixture. It's perfectly okay. In general, it's okay because you're you're measuring the heat release rate. Here. Alrighty. Any questions? All right. Uh, so. Uh, then, of course, if you were to burn a mixture of hydrogen and CO, then uh, you just have to add two more reactions. That's O plus H2, producing OH and H, and OH plus H2, forming water and a hydrogen atom. Okay? And that part of mechanism is consistent with, uh, rather identical to hydrogen oxidation, except for now the CO added gives you an added means to convert the hydroxyl radical into hydrogen atom, producing a large amount of heat because of a carbon dioxide production. So the two most critical reactions in all combustion systems is this two, CO plus OH in general, if you burn any hydrocarbon, as we will discuss, uh, about one third of enthalpy is released from this reaction, the conversion of CO to CO2. It also regenerated the hydrogen atom, facilitated the chain branching process. Okay. Uh, how much interest do you have on the NTC behavior? You do? Okay. Uh, why are you interested in NTC? I'm sorry? <coughs> Uh, let, let, let's have a five minute discussion on this topic, yeah? Okay. NTC behavior, uh, for those of you who do not know, that is, so far, what we've talked about, hydrogen <coughs> CO does not have NTC behavior. It has some weird chemical complex, uh, kinetic complexity involved, but it does not have the behavior where we will be talking about in O here. I move on to the explosion limit of uh, hydrocarbons. If you plot the same thing as how we plot for hydrogen explosion, we plot pressure, temperature, explosive, non-explosive. And these are the lines dividing explosive from non-explosive. Methane does not have any peculiar kinetic behavior. It's expected as you increase the temperature, the pressure at the explosion boundary drops. It's an interplay between Arrhenius <coughs> kinetics and a reaction rate as that's proportional to pressure. Explosive, non-explosive. When you get to ethane, you start to see the behavior over here at a low temperature, similar to methane, at a high temperature, similar to methane, but in between, 
at a temperature around 4 to 600 degrees C, you see a flat region. Grow into cropping, now you see a decided a region in which when you increase the temperature, you actually see reactivity goes down. Okay? In other words, the higher the temperature, the slower the oxidation rate. And then if you further increase the temperature, everything goes back to normal again. So this region, defined by the box, is known as the region of negative temperature coefficient. Negative temperature coefficient means the higher the temperature, the slow, slow the oxidation rate. That's an NTC behavior. And this NTC behavior, by and large, in this region, in the early days, the interest that came derived from auto ignition in gasoline engines. Okay. As you all know, prior to 1972, the way how we prevent engine knock is by adding a knock suppressant, known as a tetraethyl lead. You all know about this, right? All right. Tetraethyl lead has been a very efficient knock suppressant. Which, by the way, have you ever driven a car that gave you knock? You have, huh? Well, unless you play with an engine. Today, you don't have cars can really do that. You have to really find an old car, stick shift, to induce knock. Now, it literally works like that. You want to have, you have an old car, stick shift, you put the crutch down, gas pedal down, then you lift the crutch, it will pop. Why? <clears throat> when you do a piston engine compression, <clears throat> before it spark igniter start, you get a spontaneous auto ignition. Okay? That messes up a timing, and it's very bad. So you have to suppress the gasoline engine. Early days, we dealt this problem by tetraethyl lead, but lead is a toxic air polluter. So that's how we replaced it by what? Aromatics. So today you go to gas pump, all the unleaded gas contains about 40 to 50 percent by weight of one ring aromatics. Okay, no? 25. It came down. Yeah. Is it? 25 is about the highest. Rate. Highest, yeah, okay. And, uh, uh, you aromatics have this, has this potential of soaking up free radicals. Remember, explosion behavior is caused by uh, uh, radical chemistry. Now, the issue came about is this. Do we still need to study NTC behavior? And as you look at the literature, combustion and flame lately, there have been many papers talking about low temperature oxidation kinetics. Okay. In gasoline engine application, we probably don't need to worry about this problem anymore because kinetically, you have a suppressant for auto ignition. In diesel, you may have some problem. In gas turbine engine, the residence time is, in my view, too short to see NTC behavior to play a role. The time scale for NTC behavior typically is greater than five milliseconds. Five millisecond. You're going to have to have a homogeneous uh, fuel oxidizer mixture with resonance time longer than five milliseconds to see that behavior. Alrighty. Now, the knowing part of the NTC behavior is that the fuel chemistry, unlike a high temperature chemistry, usually sensitive to only a dozen chemical reactions. The NTC kinetics is a fuel specific. Every fuel would have its own NTC kinetic behavior. Quantitatively, qualitatively, they're more or less the same. Alrighty. Now, if you look at the wide spectrum of a combustion chemistry work we need to do, yeah. The question then becomes, are we going to do this for every fuel of some interest to us? And if so, how much work you need to do? Does auto companies, are auto companies interested in NTC behavior, the knocking behavior right now?
So it is still an interesting topic. Okay. So uh, if so, then there are plenty of work that we need to do. The fundamental issue there is how do you use, deal with the few specific kinetic behavior. All right. Most of the reaction mechanisms having about over 5,000 reactions, typically because most of these reactions uh, are there because of this MTC behavior. Okay, so for each few molecule, you have to put in about how many? On the order of 100 each, okay, minimum. Fundamentally, this MTC behavior is because of two competing reaction processes. One wants to do termination, the other wants to do branching. And these two processes would have different activation energy. Okay. If you plot in the Arrhenius plot, you get two reactions competing against each other. So that at low temperature, one process dominant, and this process is not doing termination. But when you go to high temperature, you start to have a termination reaction kick in. That competition causes this negative <laughs> temperature coefficient behavior. Okay. Specifics of this MTC behavior comes from <coughs> the direct reaction of the alkyl radical with a molecular oxygen and a consequence <coughs> of it. To do, discuss that, I want to start the low temperature oxidation chemistry of methane to get a basic understanding of how hydrocarbon fuels initiated their reaction and how does the reaction path vary as a function of temperature. Now, if you were to put the methane inside of this explosion box, you were doing an experiment. What you find is initiation occurs because of molecular oxygen being triplet, having two impaired electrons, grabbing the hydrogen from methane, producing the hydroperoxyl radical. Then you have the methyl radical produced. The methyl radical is capable of adding into molecular oxygen, forming this CH3O2 radical. That's a methyl peroxy radical. Okay. This process is pressure dependent. The rate constant is pressure dependent. At the low temperature, this reaction dominates. Low temperature, I mean below 1,000 Kelvin. Okay. When you go to this species, then it is capable, because it's a radical over here, it is capable of abstracting and a hydrogen atom from methane, producing methyl peroxy. Peroc uh, 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 uh. How do you call this radical? Methyl peroxide, excuse me, uh, and methyl radical itself. Uh, methyl peroxide would dissociate by OO bound fission or breaking, producing methoxy plus OH radical. Okay. Methyl, of, comes, of course, comes back over here, react with oxygen, so now you have a chain reaction process with this step as the chain branching. Okay. And once you form this methyl, methyl peroxy radical, it reacts with molecular oxygen to form formaldehyde, uh, producing that hydrogen uh, hydroperoxyl radical, and now the OH come here. Now it's a more efficient hydrogen, uh, more efficient for hydrogen abstraction, producing methyl water, and you go on uh, with OH additional can react with the methyl perox uh, peroxide, and all of this ends more or less to formaldehyde. Okay. And you can have subsequent reaction having formaldehyde reacting with hydroxyl radical, producing a formal HCO radical, which is one hydrogen atom more uh, that you need to get rid of to produce CO. So 
So this is roughly how the low temperature chemistry of methane takes place. Okay. The critical part of this whole thing is the production of hydrogen peroxide via hydro sorry, methyl peroxide uh, via the methyl peroxy radical. So why doesn't methane have low temperature MTC behavior? The reason for that is because of this particular reaction is highly reversible. It is extremely reversible. Methyl peroxy itself is not very stable. The most likely fate for this radical species is dissociated back to form methyl and O2. Rather than having long enough lifetime to react with methane. Okay? So it is a competition between dissociation back to the reactants and it's a subsequent reaction with methane that determines the fate of the species. The fact that it dissociates more readily back to the reactants than to react with methane causes methane to have very little MTC behavior. Okay, yes please. So in, in hydrogen oxygen chemistry where the hydroperoxyl radical becomes extremely important at higher temperatures, do you see that behavior also in methane oxygen no. with the hydroperoxyl radical? No, not here. Okay. Hydrogen uh, hydroperoxyl radical, the most efficient uh, 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 reaction is with methyl radical. It's very fast. But this is provided that you have very large amount of methyl radical. Remember, you have a radical-radical reaction. Both would have very low concentration. Even though the rate constant is large, the net rate here remains to be small. And this is unlike high-temperature oxidation. Methyl with hydrogen uh, hydroperoxyl radical is very, very fast. And that's responsible for secondary chain branch. We'll get to it. And the reason for that is you can determine this assess the importance of this hydrogen methyl peroxy uh, 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 chemistry based on the equilibrium constant consideration. If you look at the recombination of a methyl with O2 and calculate the equilibrium constant, what you find <coughs> is above 1,000 degree Kelvin, there's literally no methyl peroxy exist. Okay, and this is just number game and you, I'll leave you to uh, worry about. Now, let me just finish the whole story about methane. Let me get rid of this bouncy thing. So there's no noise. <coughs> let me finish the story of methane before I come back to the low temperature chemistry okay, of other hydrocarbons. Now you increase the temperature to about 800 Kelvin. All right, to about 800 Kelvin. There pressure as the second thermodynamic property also play a role, so the temperature here is only rough, and it's this breaking point of temperature is pressure dependent, okay? Towards intermediate temperature, now other chemistry start to play a role, and you're able to convert all the carbon to carbon dioxide. Now, if you look at that uh, initiation, the same thing, oxygen abstract and a hydrogen atom to form methyl and HO2. And subsequent reaction, once OH is produced, I'll discuss, this comes from uh, the hydrogen chain branching, you have methyl radical directly reacting with molecular oxygen, producing formaldehyde and hydroxyl radical. You have methyl now, the reaction I just talked about, reacting with the hydrogen hydroperoxy radical, producing uh, methoxy and OH. That reaction is quite fast, provided you have accumulation of methyl and HO2. Methoxy radical will react with oxygen, abstract the hydrogen atom producing formaldehyde, with HO2 produced. Then a formaldehyde uh, turns into uh, the formal radical through hydrogen abstraction, and a formal radical reacting with molecular oxygen produce CO and HO2 and the CO gets oxidized by OH. And of course, all during the process, you also have hydrogen-related reactions taking place. For example, the source of the hydroxyl radical comes mostly from HO2 recombination. 
producing hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide dissociate, forming two hydro, uh, hydroxyl radicals. Okay. Now, for those of you who haven't had enough chemistry, you know what hydrogen peroxide is, right? What do we use it for? Huh? I'm sorry, yeah, disinfectant. You can buy it from the pharmacy. So how does it, does it clean wounds? I'm sorry? It oxidizes the germ. How does it oxidize the germ? It's doing this reaction. <laughs> Literally producing hydroxyl radical. They chew up the germ, okay? So what happens in the process of cleaning the wound is also occurring in the combustion process. Oxidation is oxidation, and hydroxyl radical is the species okay, to, uh, to do this. Now, for those of you who have not stared at a reaction mechanism for long enough, by the time you get through this list, you're going to get a headache. What are the rules you can follow? Are there any simple rules you can follow? And so next time when you have a few that you don't have a mechanism in front of you, you can write something like that. Okay. So I wanted to comment on this issue first. If you start from methane, a C1 field, The next the bus stop, I call them bus stop, because you're looking at a sequence of event following the most stable path, or rather the path has to path, the path has to pass through several stable species. Methane as a few it exists because it's stable. But without <laughs> its stability, you won't be able to use this as a few to begin with. Formaldehyde is also stable. Now, interesting enough, you want to do anything fast. This is not only just combustion. This applies to everything else. You must pass through some sort of a stability node. OK? You think about tall mountains. Why aren't there any tall mountains that go strictly vertical? Because if they exist, they won't be stable. They won't withstand the geological cycle over a million year time. Over, year, over the time, you always get them corroded into slopes. If you think about the slopes, very few mountains have just straight down slopes. There are ridges, there are valleys, right? Now, just think about this intermediate species in the combustion process as the valley. And between two valleys, you must have hills connecting them. These hills can't be too high. If it's too high, the two valleys are not accessible. Okay. So methane is the top of the hill, formaldehyde is the valley, and CO2 is where everything ends in ocean. So thermodynamically, if you look at this whole thing, you are really looking at a potential energy surface. Start from methane, goes over hump to formaldehyde to CO, and finally to CO2. Reaction process are also local minima hopping over multiple barriers. All fast process in general has this behavior. It is for that reason that a combustion re reaction mechanism in general, despite of the complexity of the field, are tractable. Tractable because of the second reason that those local minima have all have their common features, <coughs> rather. They are common among all hydrocarbons. Therefore, if you were to burn benzene, 
Guess what? You have to pass through carbon monoxide over 99%. And also over 80% of the carbon must pass through formaldehyde before it gets to carbon dioxide. It's this shared potential energy path that allow us to study many different fields with a common reaction mechanism. Okay. That's the first rule you have to follow. So on the C1 ladder, the species of interest are formaldehyde, Cl, and the CO2, obviously. And there are usually intermediate species of a combustion are those usually exist in nature on their own because of the stability. Then in between, you're going to have to transform from this to that. The feature of combustion is you have chain branching. Chain branching is always about free radicals. And the free radicals are generally used to react with this local stable intermediates. And in the process over here, you have produced HCO. Okay. HCO loses enough hydrogen to produce CO2. So this is a molecular species. It has no impaired electron. The best way to go from here to there is to utilize all the radicals available to you. And the most abundant radical resulting from chain branching are hydrogen atom, OH, and O. The impaired electron in this species in general are capable of reacting with this free radical. With the impaired electron in this free radical are capable of abstracting a hydrogen atom from a stable molecule very efficiently. Then, if you look at the stable intermediates, in combustion, you typically find, even under field link condition, you shall find a significant amount of H2. That H2 is later oxidized following a mechanism of hydrogen oxidation. But the origin of this H2 molecule is the hydrogen abstraction reaction. Also in combustion process, typically the carbon chain in the eventually produced carbon dioxide occur at a very later time. However, the production of water starts and starts from the first microsecond. You shall see water rise very quickly, CO2 follow later. The reason for that is because of the OH radical abstracting the hydrogen atom from the few or from the intermediates. That product process produces water. Okay, uh, on Friday I'll show you examples. So that's a simple rule we can follow. Now, the other thing, why do formaldehyde doesn't want to react with methane directly? Answer is, both are molecular species. Neither has impaired electron. They don't like to react with each other. Okay? Typically, a direct reaction between methane and a formaldehyde is possible. But the activation energy for the process is very high, rendering the reaction rate very small, despite of the fact that concentration, because of formaldehyde being stable, is high, leading to the product of concentration of the reactants to be large. But the rate constant is very small, total rate is small. Okay. <coughs> now, why do formaldehyde tends to react with the free radicals? Well, it's because formaldehyde concentration is high. Radical concentration can be low, but the rate constant for the reaction, that's the abs hydrogen abstraction reaction, is relatively large. Number gain 
causes this type of rates to be dominant in the process. It's a number game. Now let me finish the story. So why isn't a hydrogen atom in a reaction system not immediately combining with OH? Well, because their concentration being radical species are very low. You have two reactants having small concentrations. The products of them must be small. Despite a large rate constant, the overall rate is small. So they are right. This is the simple rule you can follow when you initially start to write down the reaction mechanism. And it is that rule prevent us to write the reaction mechanism or reaction models totally on the basis of combinatorial rule. Theoretically, if you want to consider 30 chemical species, you must allow every species to react with another. The number of reactions will grow and grow very rapidly as you increase the molecular size. You don't want to do that, and you want to have some empirical principle. And in your generation, I hope 20 years from now, we have a complete ab initio way to treat this problem. Right now, the way how we're going to do that remains empirical. HCO as a free radical. Any time, the other rule of thumb you can follow is that any time a carbon is locked into oxygen, that bond probably will never break. Carbon-oxygen bonds are very, very strong. Moreover, if carbon is already bonded with oxygen, then if in a free radical form, the bond strength between carbon and hydrogen shall be very small. So this bond, carbon-hydrogen bond can break easily. So you can break this bond simply by thermally, by thermal decomposition. Or you can utilize a molecular oxygen to extract this hydrogen atom, forming CO. Okay. CO producing CO2. There are only two reactions to that job depending on the temperature. Low temperature, low to medium pressure, it's all by hydroxyl radical. That's a very fast process. When you go to very high pressure, very high, in, I mean 50 atmosphere and above, then HO2 can come in and do something. So now, this is a basically half of a combustion chemistry, believe it or not. That everything, if you can let everything go down to formaldehyde, the remaining parts stay the same, not specific to fuel itself. Okay. Then every fuel molecule leading into formaldehyde obviously is a fuel specific. But they also share many common reactions. Already. In general, the rule is that you must create free radicals from the hydrocarbon fuel molecule itself. For saturated fuel specifically, especially. Methane has nothing available to grab an oxygen. So you have to remove the hydrogen before this process can stop. So this is done just like a formaldehyde, turning into formal. You'll do this by adding hydrogen, reacting it with hydrogen, hydroxyl radical, and O atom, abstracting the hydrogen. You produce methyl. However, the minute you have a free radical exist on the carbon atom, the next step is always, almost exclusively, for small hydrocarbon species. For large, I'll talk about a little later is to hook this carbon with an oxygen. And you ask, what's the most abundant in a reaction process? Got to be molecular oxygen. All right, it's a reactant. So the next step, as we wrote over there, is to directly reacting with molecular oxygen. Usually, there are two paths it can go. One is go to formaldehyde straight. The other is to produce methoxy. Methoxy, in terms of its kinetic property, is very similar to the formal radical. 
That is, one of the three hydrogen atoms wants to go. It wants to go hard, so hard that the lifetime of this methoxy radical is usually very short. It decomposes thermally, or you can help it by removing the hydrogen ion through molecular oxygen. And this is a literally the mechanism of how methane gets burned under fueling condition. Okay. Let me summarize the rule of thumb you can use to put a reaction model together. The first step, obviously, is you have to know what fuel you're interested in. Thermodynamic driving force tells us that the final product must be carbon dioxide and water. You know the bus start, you know that the bus stop end. In between, you find that the bus stops. The bus stops are those stable species. How do you know what are the stable species? You can't guess it. Run the equilibrium calculation. Run an equilibrium calculation, identify molecular species that would have relatively high concentration. If you run an equilibrium calculation, say at 1200 Kelvin. Why 1200? Well, I'll talk about later. Okay? So the empirical <coughs> rule that I use is I start at 1200 Kelvin, I run methane. For example, stoichiometric with oxygen in air. And I will look at the equilibrium species concentration. What you will typically find is formaldehyde concentration would be of the order of 100 to 1,000 ppm. Of course, if you go to very high temperature, 2,000 Kelvin, you'll find no formaldehyde. I do 1,200 Kelvin because Flame usually doesn't start until 1400 Kelvin. Okay. And I find, of course, CO would have at least about 1% in it. Alrighty? So that's the thermodynamic principle. You do this exercise a couple of times, you'll find that those intermediate species that the bus stops, in fact, is all identical at least for the small hydrocarbon. As if the bus stop, different buses, different routes, start from different location in the city. At the end, they always end up in the same spot. All right, that's a tr train station, so to speak. Before that, they share many same bus stops. All righty? That's the empirical rule we can use. All Let me complete the story about methane oxidation at a high temperature, a couple of other problems you have to worry about. The way how we work in any science project is that you find the rule first, then you ask for what are exceptions. All right? You identify the intermediate species, you use the principle of a bound energy. We're talking about that. Those radicals have small bound energy will dissociate, or if they are, have hydrogen available, most likely they're going to be abstracted by molecular oxygen. If you have a stable structure, they go to the next stable structure, usually through an intermediate by hydrogen abstraction reaction. Then you ask, well, let me write down the annoying part of the exception. Usually the list is longer than the rule. But the rule would give you good enough length speed by now. Okay, if you know the rate constant. Going to high temperature, and that's where I want to talk about, use this opportunity to talk about a few exceptions here, using methane as an example. You go to very high temperature, well, high temperature is temperature above about 1,000 Kelvin. Okay. Again, those numbers, don't take it religiously. This was just used as a reference point. I want to say 1,000. It could be 900. It could be 1,200. It's not important. Okay. You take methane, react with molecular oxygen. You have to generate some free radicals. And that has to be done either through fuel dissociation. O2 will not dissociate. 
and any circumstance in combustion problem, the old bound strength is very high. So you either dissociate a few or you let a few to directly react with molecular oxygen. That's always universally true. There are only perhaps two pathways. The third pathway I'll talk about later. Now, methane at a very high temperature can break the CH bond. The bound strength here is about a little over 100 kilocalorie per mole. It's not easy to break a carbon-hydrogen bond, but it can. What follows is that you have this abundant amount of free radical will abstract the hydrogen ion from methane always leads to methyl formation. Methyl then can react with molecular oxygen, either forming formaldehyde or methoxy. Methoxy following this two pathway we just talked about producing formaldehyde. Methyl plus HO2, methoxy. Okay. And then once radical becomes abundant, you can form O ion. O ion reacting with methyl at almost at a collision rate. Every collision will lead to a reaction. Now, exceptions. When you have too much radical, too many radicals in a system, methyl can loosen the hydrogen ion, forming methylene radical. These are triplet methylene radicals. It has two impaired electrons. Okay. Methylene in general gets oxidized directly by molecular oxygen, bypassing formaldehyde, goes straight to formal radical. And of course, one other path that is critical is methyl plus HO2. Okay. Then the remaining path are those we already talked about. How do you convert from formaldehyde to the formal radical? And how do you convert from the formal radical to carbon monoxide? And to complete the story, once you form carbon monoxide, the last step universally is CO plus OH producing CO2, giving you a large amount of heat through this process. Okay. Now, I want to make a small comment. It is this very reaction, methyl reacting with hydroxyl radical producing CH2, in fact, and the subsequent reaction of a CH2 contributes to the chemical luminescence of flames. It's the subsequent reaction related to CH2 that produced the CH, electronically excited CH, that gave rise to the fact that you have a color from a flame. But if you notice here, that's way down in the ladder of the chain reaction cycle. So the fact that the flame gives you a blue luminosity does not mean that blue luminosity is involved in the heat release process itself. OK? All right. Now, the exception here has been CH2. And let me just review now, using this example, I talked about this already. The important rule of the thumb, beyond the combinatorial rule, allowing every species to react with another, is that you can follow this simple rule that if I have a reaction between molecule with molecule, by molecular reaction, you have reactant one and reactant two. Because they are molecules, they tend to be stable. Stable species tend to have high concentrations in the flame. Therefore, both concentrations are large, but the rate constant would be very small. The rule of thumb to follow is that rate must be small, because the rate coefficient dominated by Arrhenius kinetics having high activation energy would give you a very small rate constant. Molecule radical reaction, you have first reactant having large concentration, you have a second reactant being the radical unstable, have a small concentration. Rate constant is somewhere in between. Typically, molecule radical reaction has about 10 kilocalories per mole of activation energy, rule of thumb. The net result is they would have very large rate. Okay. Radical radical reaction, the rate coefficient would be very large. Having two impaired electrons, they usually love each other. You collide them, they'll pair up and forming a uh, a, a combined species. 
but they are, their concentrations are both are very small, leading to a small rate. Okay. Those are the general rule we can follow. Now, let's talk about NTC behavior, going to high hydrocarbons. And in that discussion, I also highlight the difference among different fields in the similar <coughs> I must caution you that uh, the NTC behavior that I'm going to talk about is very simple. I went for only the lowest denominator of giving you a flavor of what's responsible for this behavior. For me to talk about the whole NTC behavior will cost you another month of your time. And the best lecture to go look at is the lecture during the first summer school by by Dr. Charlie Westbrook. He is the world leading expert on NTC behavior. If you flip through his lecture notes, he has talked a lot about NTC behavior or chemistry. Okay. Now, we said earlier that NTC behavior starts to occur for propane. All right, so what's the mechanism for it? The initiation in a radical process, again, starts from uh, towards fairly low temperature three to 400 degrees C. It starts with molecular oxygen abstracting a hydrogen atom from propane. But since propane has two types of hydrogen atoms, six on the two end carbon atom, two in the middle, those high two types of hydrogen atom would have different reactivity, rather different tendency towards hydrogen abstraction number one, number two. You would end up, through the abstraction process, two different free radical species. One is called I, isopropyl radical, with the hydrogen atom uh, missing from the middle carbon. The normal propyl radical would have the hydrogen atom residing on the two end carbon. They are equivalent <coughs> before you remove the hydrogen atom. But these are all propyl radicals. And for propyl radical, let me simplify here. I will denote them as R with a dot. Dot specified. This is an alkyl group with a radical on it. The next most abundant species in the system before explosion start got to be molecular oxygen. OK? And R dot, that's the alkyl radical, recombine with molecular oxygen to form RO2. That's a peroxy radical, just like how methyl reacting with O2. Peroxy radical would react with uh, uh, oxygen also to form a difference. What did I do wrong here? All right, let me do the simplest thing possible. Now, there are Another pathway involved, in general, this is not uh, clear cut, but let me just use this, what I wrote here. It can form two different reaction product. One is RO2, the other is a transformed R, that's the alkyl radical, with O2H. These two reactions can be visualized in two separate ways. The first is, if I look at starting from the normal propyl radical. Oxygen at the radical site is at the end oxygen atom. Okay. This species, if you look at the structure of it, you have some R prime. CH3, CH2, C, you have a hydrogen here, you have a hydrogen there. <coughs> the oxygen group is a flexible through internal rotation. Okay, it can swing. As it swing, it can bump into either this hydrogen atom or that hydrogen atom. The result is that you can do internal hydrogen abstraction, grabbing either this hydrogen atom or that. The rates are different, 
but both are possible. The result is you are shifting the free radical from the oxygen atom to the alkyl chain. In doing so, forming the OOH end group. So that's the second reaction. I'll just write this for simplicity as an example. And this species is this second reaction over there. Okay. In general, the larger the alkyl group you have, the more likely you're going to form this first, followed by internal isomerization to form that. But the point is, as I will talk about in tomorrow, within the reaction unimolecular reaction rate theory, this process can go in one step, direct, or it can go here, then following an isomerization pass to go to that. Okay, this process is known as the chemically activated process. <coughs> this process is known as the unimolecular isomerization. And that is known as the bimolecular combination. Each of them is something we're going to talk about tomorrow. Okay. Now, going back to what we talked about. The third pass now involves R plus O2 produce olefin. In doing so, spitting out an HO2. Okay. So how do we do that based on this path? If you look at this process, this species, you can break the carbon-oxygen bond. What you get is HO2 lag. But if you look at this species, it's a CH2, CH2, CH2. You get a two unpaired electron. One is here, one is going to be there. Dye radicals, in general, are very unstable. Therefore, it won't go there. If you end up with this species, this carbon-oxygen bound probably won't break because you have to go up to too high a potential energy to get there, owing to instability of the species. Unstable species, uh, from the standpoint of potential energy, usually means it is, lies very high in the potential energy surface. Okay. Rather, the second possibility is that this internal isomerization can be done by abstracting the middle hydrogen. Now you can have an olefin produced. Okay. With that, you broke this, break this bond. It produces an olefin in this form, in this case, propane. And its structure is CH3. CH double bond CH2 plus the HO2 radical. Okay. Now, the competition of these three processes determines the NTC behavior. Some of this reaction leads to chain branching, whereas others leads to temporary chain termination. And to continue the story, uh, I'll get to this issue later. In this case, the RO2 radical, that one, all right, if it stays at a shape and a form before it is summarized to these two species and eventually produce all of them, it has a long enough lifetime to directly react with the field itself. That's the RH. 
grabbing the hydrogen atom, leaving behind an alkyl radical. Of course, an alkyl radical will react with molecular oxygen, reproducing the alkyl proxy. So you have a chain reaction, no doubt. Now, the chain branching occurs because of ROH. The oxygen-oxygen bond usually is weak, just like the <laughs> hydrogen peroxide. Breaking into RO and OH. And OH now can do a much better job of tracking this hydrogen atom produced alkyl radical, which comes back, react with molecular oxygen. Sustain this chain reaction cycle with this reaction in the chain branching starting with no free radical, ending with two free radical species. Okay. So how did the NTC behavior play come up? Well, it has to do with this reaction. Okay. If you can prevent ROH production, and therefore preventing chain branching, then you'll kill the reaction process. All right. The way how you do that is go through this route. And this route subsequently breaking the carbon oxygen bond produce this propyl radical, which is quite stable, won't do much. The HO2 radical, before it accumulates its concentration at a low temperature, it's also quite unre unreactive. So in other words, the first ROH dissociation leads to chain branching. Those two effectively leads to by and large chain termination. Okay. Now it turns out that these reactions would have different activation energy. As you increase the activate temperature those two remaining reactions become faster. In doing so, kill the reactivity. Therefore, reactivity takes a no dive as you increase the temperature before the high temperature chemistry start to kick in. Intermediate to high temperature chemistry start to kick in. So this issue is important to engine log, and if you're interested in this issue, uh, there are quite a bit to read, and I can only afford to give you that much of qualitative discussion. And that leads to, uh, this, this issues are related to octane number of uh, different fuels. And I'll leave this topic out, because for those of you who, interest, who know this stuff, uh, you probably know the things more than I do. And if you don't, it'll take me too long to discuss it. Just me, uh, let me ask you one thing. I know that I, we have a couple of people from auto industry and people who are doing research on auto engines. So what I say here, if I'm not right, correct me. Okay. You go to gas station, you see octane number, right? Usually R plus M divided by two method. Have you ever noticed that? The ROM and the MOM. All right, that's not important. In the US, typically the rating is 87, 89, 91. 87 called the regular, 89 called what is it called? God. Huh? 93. Oh, 91, 93, all those are called a supreme or somehow. Already? What do you use? I'm sorry? 87. Why 87? <laughs> huh? <laughs> all right. You must drive in a pretty inexpensive car, <laughs> as the rest of us do. But the answer is very simple. For those of you who have not heard about that, typically this is a compression ratio dependent. Unless you drive a fancy car capable of doing high compression ratio, 87 is good enough. Okay? TV commercial will never tell you that truth. They'll tell you rather the Supreme 9193 octane rating or combustion will be cleaner, better to your engine. Well, that's not true. They also don't release more heat, okay? It may be more efficient if you have a fancy car that can do variable compression ratio. 
How many cars are compression ratio, very, can do variable compression ratio now? I'm sorry? 12, as high as 12, okay. But not every car can do compression, variable compression ratio, am I correct? Car actually do that, yeah. yeah. Well, long story short, if you don't drive a fancy sports car, get 87 is just fine. <laughs> okay. And all this has to do with uh, NTC behavior. I'll skip that and I needed to go to an important part of today's lecture. That is, go to high alkene oxidation at a high temperature. And that's by far responsible for all flame behaviors of practical real fuels. Normal alkene, starting from that. The initiation of any normal alkene, well, here, what example do I use? I'll stick to that, but I'll stick with coffee. Initiation, again, not initiation. Once you have free radicals in a system, obviously, just like a methane, the next step is to produce the propyl radicals. There are two of them, the iso and the normal. And what do they do next? At low temperature, this rests radicals tends to react with molecular oxygen. But the minute the temperature exceeds about 1,000 to 1,200 Kelvin, this species will break on their own. The rule to break them is the beta zition principle. Long story short, where the radical is, is called the alpha atom, carbon atom. The one next to it, not a hydrogen, but a carbon I'm talking about right now, is called the beta carbon. Typically, it is the bond to the beta carbon that breaks first. And that requires very small activation energy, all right? So by this principle, the normal propyl radical will break the carbon-carbon bond when removed from the alpha carbon and therefore the alpha bond. The result is that it produces methyl and ethylene. If you apply this principle to any high hydrocarbon, it just does not matter how many CH2 you add, I mean alkenes. Let me just arbitrary use a longer chain. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A hectane. If you take away the hydrogen atom on the end of carbon, the next step is will break off on the beta bond, yielding one ethylene. But once you do that, you have produced the same carbon radical. You'll break next here and there. OK? For such a long snake, you chop off a tooth, the whole thing breaks apart, following this mechanism. Now the beauty of this beta zition mechanism is that starting from a long chain alkene fuel, you quickly decompose this fuel as far as a radical, as long as you have radical uh, exist, and if temperatures are high enough, what you basically have to deal with at the end is the combustion chemistry of methyl and ethylene. 
We already know how methyl is oxidized. We just have to learn how ethylene is oxidized. Now that's too simple a description because you're going to have to find exceptions. The exception here may be viewed by this radical. The isopropyl radical, in fact, also follow the beta scission rule, except this beta bond, or the available beta bond, is carbon hydrogen bond. So if it doesn't have any carbon bond to break, you're going to have to break the carbon hydrogen bond. The result is that you produce propene and a hydrogen atom. Rule of thumb, if you have a beta carbon carbon bond to break, break that first. <coughs> okay? If you run out of a beta carbon bond, you break the beta carbon hydrogen bond. Yes, please. What about the CO bond and the OH bond? We'll get to that. Okay. Let's stay with hydrocarbon first. Okay. Once you have oxygenates, things become a little messy because of other issues. Okay. Already? So let me just reiterate this point. This simplifies things tremendously. Again, if you have a free radical on the carbon atom, Typically, you have three alpha bonds. You have three beta bonds. And the one next to is a carbon gamma bond. The rule is that you break the carbon carbon beta bond first before you get to anything else. Okay? The alpha bond is impossible to break. The gamma bond is also <coughs> impossible to break. This is not empirical. This is purely based on consideration of a bond energy. If you look at the uh, N-butyl radical, I added one carbon atom. It wasn't, it's not a propene now, it's a butyl. So the original butyl radical, uh, N-butyl is CH3, CH2, CH2, CH2. And alpha beta bound, there are two different types of alpha bound. If you remove this hydrogen from the, from the alpha bound, or if you break the alpha carbon carbon bond, what you see is net result is you generate a three unpaired electron from starting from one unpaired electron. That of course is associated with a large bond energy. Okay. In comparison to beta bond, what you find is breaking the carbon carbon bond requires 104 kilojoule per mole which is smaller than the carbon-hydrogen beta bond. It's 151. <coughs> that is the fundamental reason why the beta carbon bond breaks first. Okay? And as, as I said, if you have nothing else to break, you'll go to the 151. Already? Let's go to the gamma bond. Again, breaking of a gamma bond produces three impaired electron, and it doesn't like it the bound energy becomes excessively high. All right? Now, despite this empirical beta scission rule, the real more rigorous analysis requires us, in fact, to look into the bound energy, something we talked about yesterday. Okay. Now, in the case of butyl, at the end, you might get, in the case of a propyl radical, as we discussed here, the end product, you have ethylene, propene, hydrogen atom, and methyl. In the case of butyl radical, and butyl radical, after you break this bond, uh, what you get is <coughs> ethyl. The ethyl radical is also not very stable. It tends to lose the hydrogen atom, produce ethylene. Now, do you all know that during early days of combustion chemistry research, most of the work is done on which hydrocarbon? It's done on ethylene. Ethylene is a model fuel. 
and it remained to be the model field primarily because of the consideration that ethylene is one of the dominant intermediate species in a combustion process. Okay, we passed that, but still, when you look at something, ethylene is always, if you look at a new combustion phenomenon, ethylene typically is where you start. Okay. And uh, this is everything that I've talked about. So, how does the ethylene get oxidized? All right. That's in fact the last part of the combustion chemistry as far as NL King is concerned. Ethylene. The fact that now I have a double carbon carbon bond. I have an unsaturated hydrocarbon, gave rise to additional possibilities. Recall that this is a bus stop, and in a C1 bus <coughs> stop, when you have formaldehyde, what you can do to it is to abstract the hydrogen atom. In this case, there are other possibilities. Hydrogen abstraction does occur in this case. If you react with a hydrogen atom, or the hydroxyl radical, what you produce is a vinyl radical. <coughs> All right, vinyl, it's the same as a PVC polyvinyl chloride. It's the same vinyl. Produce H2 and water. Here, the principle is similar to methyl oxidation. The next step is to react it with molecular oxygen. In the product, there are a couple. I'll write down two most important ones. One is a formaldehyde plus HCO. How does that reaction occur at elementary level? It occurs at elementary level as you have carbon-carbon double bond, I'm neglecting the hydrogen here. You have a free radical here. Oxygen will attack it, okay? Produce this complex. Now, the most next step for this to go is for oxygen to wiggle around, directly hook onto this carbon, okay? Owing to the existence of the double bond. In doing so, you break pi bond. The next step is you break from the middle. Oxygen always have a large propensity attacking carbon. You give it a chance, when you have a valence electron available for you to do it, it will do it. The result is this part goes to HCO, this part becomes formaldehyde. Now we're good already. We're down to parts of a methane oxidation chemistry. There is one other pathway involving oxygen now going to attack okay, <laughs> and breaking the oxygen oxygen bond. So what you have is you form the CH2, CHO plus O atom. This is called a vinoxy. And this is, of course, the actual oxygen atom we know. Vinoxy can loosen the hydrogen atom, produce ketone. Or most likely, it's going to isomerize hydrogen hop over here, break in the middle. So most likely pass for it to move forward is methyl or CO. Okay. Now, that's this part. We'll have to take a break in two minutes here. What you notice is that I did not put in the oxygen atom there. As a matter of fact, oxygen atom attack methyl atom, uh, ethylene. Most of the hydrogen abstraction still occur, but equally important is you have oxygen directly attacking the carbon. Stick to it because of the pi electron available. 
And the result is that oxygen attack onto a carbon atom, adding it into it. Let me ask you, what would be? Once I form this species, what is the most likely outcome next? I'm sorry? You form an epoxy bond. Is that what you're talking about? This is a species called ethylene oxide. Yeah. Or uh, I call it ethylene oxide. But at a high temperature, where would it just go? Anyone? Well, it turns out that Epoxy doesn't it does happen. But at high temperature, you open up again. So you close the ring, you open the ring, close the ring, and open the ring. Give it a chance. You have to remember, this is a, has a radical side. This also had a, has a radical side. Turns out that the most viable part is <coughs> for one of these two hydrogen to hop over. Why? It wants to hop over. It's because as soon as this hydrogen hop over, this carbon oxygen bond becomes a double bond. You have one impaired electron, you lose the hydrogen, you now have one impaired electron. The original oxygen has one impaired electron, you form a double carbon carbon, carbon oxygen bond. Double carbon oxygen bond always love to form. Give it a chance, make it a form, it will do that. Why? It releases lots of heat. When you have this species now, the next thing you have to do is break this. What do you get is methyl and HCO. Okay. Now by now I got kind of your question. Everything just goes down to methyl, formal. In some case, formaldehyde and a CO. Quickly. Yeah. It can form <coughs> acetaldehyde. Okay. At a combustion temperature, when it hops over, it can form this species is stable. Once hydrogen gets hopped over, it forms CH3, CHO. That's a stable species. But Again, something I will talk about yet tomorrow. Chemical activity. Methyl, excuse me, ethylene and oxygen both lie very high in their enthalpy of formation. So as you react them together, all right, acetaldehyde can form. But there's too much energy from reactions like that to stabilize it. There's so much vibration of energy that tends to break this carbon-carbon bond. The net result is you still have an excessively exothermic reaction. And that's the principle of a chemically activated process. In general, unsaturated hydrocarbon, whether it's ethylene, acetylene, <coughs> propene, propyne, when they react with molecular oxygen, excuse me, atomic oxygen, they tend to break down into formal <coughs> and leaving behind the alkyl group due to hydrogen hopping. Okay? Because they have way too much excess in copy. That has to go somewhere. Again, a topic I'll talk about yesterday. Well, let's take a break. Sorry that I went a little longer, the first half of the lecture. We will uh, come back at. Uh, 10 before, we take about a 24 minute break.